Na nai hari mai tiki mai kiti na kopepe kanoi te mihi kia koto katoa. Welcome and thank you for joining this session and thank you for the support um, of this important topic. I've had the privilege of jointly developing this presentation with Christina Papadimitriou over the last few weeks and I'm really looking forward to sharing our discussion and some of the thinking we've done on this topic with you. Here are some disclosures from both Christina and I. And these are the learning outcomes um, for the session, which hopefully you will already have seen on the ACRM portal. Before I begin, though, I'm going to introduce um, myself and um, where I'm based. So, ko wai o, ko a titanangi te maunga, ko a tūranga nui te awa, ko a tūranga nui a kiwa a hau, ko a tairafti taki tūranga waiwai, ko Aotearoa toku kainga. Ko Jobson toku Fano. Ko Brian Rawa ko Diane Oku Matua, ko David Kays Takitane, ko Jaden Rawa ko Kobe Akutama, ko Nicola Kays Taku Inua, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I've just introduced myself using my pipiha. Māori, the indigenous people of New Zealand, use a pipiha to introduce themselves. A pipiha uses a set structure to tell people who you are by sharing your connections with the people and places that are important to you. So I have just um, told you that I um, grew up in a place called Gisborne on the east coast of New Zealand, which is marked in red on this map. And I've got some beautiful photos from the east coast in Gisborne on the slide in front of you, so you can see some of um, where I come from and the places that I've talked about in my PPH. I've also introduced my family um, both my my parents, but also my husband and two sons who you see in the photo on the left hand side. So I, since 2015, have had the privilege of being director of a research centre called the Centre for Person Centred Research. Um, but actually, I um, was employed at AUT in 2005 and um, by a woman named Kath McPherson, who was Professor of Rehabilitation at AUT at the time. And the um, Centre for Person-Centred Research has really, was really conceptualised um, through the work that she was doing at the time. So I still remember the day that Kath, myself and one other colleague um, sat down at a table in her office and we were trying to decide what could we call ourselves, you know, what was different and unique about the research that we were doing compared to what else was going on in the university at that time. And where we got to was that it was the, the focus on person-centred research and embedding person-centredness in rehabilitation um, that really set us apart from what other people were doing within our department at that time. And that name has stuck, that is still with us today. And you can see on the slide here that embedding person-centredness is still one of the the core philosophies that drive the way we work in the centre, but also the topics that we explore and research. So consistent with the title of this presentation, we have focused this presentation on where we've come from in person-centred rehabilitation and where we need to go next. And I'm going to do this by focusing on three key aspects of person-centred rehab the rhetoric and the brand of person-centred rehabilitation, the concept and practice of person-centred rehabilitation, and the system and organisational culture of person-centred rehabilitation. So to get started, where have we come from when we think about the rhetoric and the brand of person-centred rehabilitation? The rhetoric of person-centred rehabilitation is strong. It is embedded within professional competencies, within our service frameworks, and within our accreditation bodies. So the language of person-centred rehabilitation is very familiar. It also has a strong presence in frameworks that are, or should be, formative to the way we work. Similarly, the brand of person-centredness is strong. The language from this NHS plan in the UK frames it as a consumer-driven endeavour. To quote, today, successful services thrive on their ability to respond to the individual needs of their customers. We live in a consumer age, 
services have to be tailor-made, not mass-produced, geared towards the needs of users, not the convenience of producers. Repositioning patients and families as consumers has played a key role in the rise of person-centered practice as a key brand and marketing tool for rehab providers. The snapshot in the center of this slide is for a US-based rehab provider, but you could go to just about any website for any rehab provider in the Western world and see something similar. There are even campaigns designed to remind us about some of the basics of person-centered care. The Hello My Name Is campaign initiated by a doctor and terminally ill patient in the UK is just one of many campaigns that you might recognize. Furthermore, there is a burgeoning academic field focused on better understanding the concept of person-centered rehabilitation, growing the evidence base for person-centered rehab and establishing evidence-based frameworks and measures to support the practice of person-centered rehab. These are all good things, as it puts person-centered rehab on the map, right? And creates the context for ongoing practice and knowledge advance. However, at the same time, there are some risks. Firstly, the volume and the presence of, of the rhetoric and the brand of person-centered rehab has the potential to lead to complacency. As if we already have it nailed, and that it's time to move on and invest our time and energy elsewhere. There's also the risk of reducing person-centered rehabilitation to a transactional tick box approach. This is perpetuated by campaigns like the Hello My Name Is campaign, which sell the simplicity of person-centered care, but in doing so, minimize the inherent complexity and embedding person-centered ways of working in the context of a system, which has a range of competing drivers and interests. The paper shown on the slide here from authors based at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden argues that models of person-centered care can risk just replacing the assumptions of biomedicine with assumptions of their own. For example, a consumer-driven perspective of person-centered care may focus on promoting autonomy and prioritize the active involvement of clients in decisions about their care. However, this assumes that autonomy is the desired goal, and it relies on the capacity of individuals to be actively involved in their care. In this sense, fixed assumptions about what constitutes person-centered rehabilitation may inadvertently count some people out of person-centered care, such as those with cognitive or communication impairment. All this begs the question, of whether the rhetoric that exists within professions, within service frameworks, and which is embedded within our professional identities as rehab professionals, truly reflects the reality of person-centered rehab in practice. The evidence increasingly points to the complexity of person-centered rehab. For example, Malloy highlights that positioning health professionals as experts and the desire to maintain credibility can make it difficult for health professionals to express vulnerability, a characteristic which may be key within person-centered cultures of care. Austin, the paper on the bottom right here, challenges us to think about whether professional boundaries is the most useful metaphor for promoting the therapeutic potential of relational ways of working and proposes and toys with a range of other possible metaphors such as a bridge or a territory. In collaboration with Barb Gibson from the University of Otago, we've attempted to promote some critical thinking about the scripts that mediate practice in rehab, the extent to which they circumscribe what actions are possible and how they work with persons in context to enact or not person-centered rehab. These are just some examples of the growing body of literature challenging some of our taken for granted assumptions around aspects of person-centered care. Given these complexities, we undertook a secondary analysis of qualitative data collected over the years, capturing people's experiences of their engagement with rehab services. 
We wanted to see what we could learn about person-centred rehab by drawing on lived experience. We wanted to see what we could learn from examples of positive deviance in rehab practice. In other words, instead of focusing on the complexities of person-centred rehab, what can we learn from situations where care has been experienced as person-centred in spite of the apparent tensions and uncertainties associated with its implementation? In our findings, we conceptualise person-centred rehab as building connectivity, trust and capability in the context of an uncertain and unstable reality. Instead of focusing on fixed behaviours or specific characteristics that constitute person-centred rehab, we articulated principles which could underpin the person-centred culture of care. Core principles, for example, included the importance of recognising the context of care for persons and families, a relational orientation to care, building a currency of trust and enabling efficacy. In this sense, person-centred care, person-centred rehab is a nuanced and reflexive, responsive way of working focused on meeting the person where they're at. Rather than a predefined set of professional behaviours and actions. In other words, ironically, we might call this a person-centred approach to person-centred rehabilitation. So, we have a strong rhetoric and brand. This provides a good scaffold for person-centred rehab, no doubt. However, if we rely solely on the rhetoric and brand, we may be at risk of missing the mark. The mismatch between rhetoric and reality has led to a range of research which highlights the complexity of embedding person-centred rehab into practice in a more fundamental way. As a result, we are developing an increasingly nuanced understanding of person-centred rehab. So where do we go next with the rhetoric and brand of person-centred rehab? Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to take part in a World Health Organization discussion focused on person-centered care. In this session, Polly Mitchell, a research fellow and philosopher based in King's College London, did a brief thought-provoking presentation. She argued that person-centered care is a multi-dimensional concept which invokes a plurality of values, such as dignity, compassion, and which requires working with a plurality, plur, plurality <laughs> of virtues, such as empowerment, kindness, and honesty. However, these dimensions can be variably defined. For example, concepts like empowerment have been hotly debated and contested. In one respect, it talks to the process of getting stronger and developing confidence. On the other hand, it has inherent assumptions about who holds the power and who can empower. The other thing she noted is that some dimensions cluster together, such as care, compassion and kindness, while others consider intention with one another, such as integrity and kindness. Further, the relative importance of different dimensions can be context specific. For example, there may be differences in the dimensions that are more or less important when managing acute injury compared to more significant trauma where there might be more enduring impact. So we may need to call on different values and virtues in different situations. The relative importance of different dimensions may also be person specific. For example, some people will really value open, honest, transparent communication over kindness and compassion, whereas others may value the opposite. Given this, recognising and developing a better understanding of the multi-dimensional nature of person-centred rehab has the potential to be formative to, fu to further advance in this field. Because of this multi-dimensionality, as I've already noted, we suggest we also need to move beyond the idea that person-centred rehab is associated with particular actions or behaviours. Rather, we might instead agree on some core central tenets of person-centred rehab, such as 
meeting the person where they're at. And agree on some principles to understand, to underpin practice that enable a more nuanced, reflexive approach, such as making no assumptions, prioritising relationship, co-constructing engagement. In essence, this means much less focus on specifying what constitutes person-centred rehab, and instead focusing on how we work and who we are with our clients. Secondly, we argue that we also need to move beyond thinking about person-centred rehab as a dichotomy, that you are either person-centred or you're not. And rather than think about person-centred rehab on a continuum, the idea that you are either person-centred or not is one of the things that perpetuates this more transactional approach to person-centred rehab. It also puts people in the position of having to buy into the rhetoric or not. Most rehab providers, I'm sure you would agree, inherently believe in the value of a person-centred approach. If nothing else, it is frequently viewed as a moral and ethical imperative by those in helping professions. So asking a rehab provider if they ascribe to and enact a person-centred approach in their work or not, risks calling into question a key aspect of their professional identity. However, thinking about person-centred rehab as being on a continuum allows for a more open, honest and respectful conversation about where on the continuum you are. It also allows for a more reflexive approach to practice development focused on moving on the continuum, wherever your starting point. So we've talked about the rhetoric and brand of person-centred rehab. I'm now going to focus on the concept and practice of person-centred rehab. So where have we come from? First of all, there is an extensive body of research aiming to conceptualise, define, operationalise and measure, evaluate person-centredness. Despite this, it's been argued that there remains a lack of consensus on definitions of person-centred care. This is possibly compounded by the fact that there are also a range of overlapping concepts. For example, in the literature we also talk about relationship-centred, family-centred, child-centred practice. In addition, there are new approaches being developed all the time, such as life world led rehabilitation, which are often argued to advance beyond person-centred rehab, often in response to the perception that it has not achieved what we hoped it would. Finally, we have disciplinary specific models of person-centred care. The problem with this is that it leads to conceptual blurring and competing ideas about what person-centred rehab is and how it can be operationalised in practice. There is a risk of person-centred rehab being primarily an academic endeavour, as we all jostle to untangle the conceptual pieces of the puzzle, and in doing so, we hamper the potential for practice advance. Indeed, this may be one of the factors that hinders our ability to meaningfully translate person-centred rehab into education and practice. That said, work is being undertaken to synthesise the evidence to underpin a framework for rehab practice. Christina and myself have been involved in a large scoping review being led by Tiago Jesus, aiming to bring together, unpack and synthesise the large body of existing evidence already available to us. The figure you see on this screen now is the framework that we have developed through this work. We're currently finalising a publication on this, so this is half the press. You can see here that we're proposing some key principles that can underpin practice within the therapeutic encounter, as well as some key characteristics which help to create the context for person-centred rehab at the system level, both the micro-system level and macro-system level. As well as this, there's also a lot of work being carried out to develop tools and ways of working to embed person-centred ways of working into our core rehab processes. 
The examples on the screen here are examples from some of the work being undertaken in my research centre. Our goal planning work, for example, focuses on optimising the therapeutic potential of goal planning processes when you anchor the goals and tasks of rehab to what matters most to the person. We've also undertaken work to unpack what matters most in the therapeutic relationship. From the perspective of patients and health professionals to inform rehab education and practice. And to support the development of therapeutic relationships in rehab, which foster engagement and belief in self. Finally, on the right hand side here, we've developed with professionals and patients a living well toolkit for people living with long-term conditions to support person-centered communication, optimize continuity of care, and to harness the strengths and resources of individuals and families. These are just examples from my research center. There are many more examples around the world, both from research, but also driven from within practice. So, we have a range of competing definitions, concepts, and disciplinary based frameworks. This has led to conceptual blurring and has hindered practice advance and person centered rehab. However, there is a range of work ongoing which we can draw on and build on. And I've given examples of work being undertaken to synthesize and reconcile conceptual differences so we can move towards a shared understanding of person centered rehab. So, where do we go next with the concept in practice? of person-centred rehab. If we are going to be truly embedding person-centred rehab into practice, we need to give it more legitimate space in rehab education and practice. Currently, person-centred rehab is at risk of being viewed as a nice thing to have rather than a critical component of care. In education, we have this tendency to talk about hard skills and soft skills. In doing so, we inadvertently undermine the value of person-centered skills. We separate out and prioritize technical skills as the hallmark of a profession, with person-centered and collaborative processes simply a means to an end, versus having the potential for therapeutic benefit in their own right. I was speaking to a postgraduate group recently and one of the students was reflecting on her time as a new grade physio and on the time since then when she had been trying to put new skills into practice. She reflected that in those moments when she was putting new technical skills into practice and when she really needed to concentrate on what she called being the best that she can be, she dropped the person-centered and collaborative processes. This example really highlights how quickly these processes can take a back seat in favour of other aspects of practice, which are viewed as more critical or legitimate. So we really need a fundamental shift in how we introduce, integrate and value person-centred and collaborative processes within our health curriculums. However, we also need to be confident that our graduates will graduate into a rehab system where they can retain the capacity for person-centered rehab, that it is valued and legitimized within the system. Fundamentally, this means also building capability across the system, including with funders, insurers and policy makers. Currently, we are also primarily informed by Western-centric understandings of person-centered rehab. We can, however, learn a tremendous amount from non-Western and Indigenous perspectives, both because that has the potential to enhance and augment our understanding of person-centered rehab, but more importantly, because embedding more culturally informed perspectives of person-centered rehab into practice is one step towards addressing the inequities in access, experience and outcome experienced by Indigenous and minority populations globally. My group have recently been doing some work exploring New Zealand Māori perspectives of therapeutic relationship. While there are definitely some areas over overlap, there are also many aspects that can help to extend how we think about person-centred rehab. 
For example, a key process of connecting with Māori is through their whakapapa. They introduce themselves, as I did at the beginning of this presentation, by talking about their connection to the whenua, to the land, their iwi, their tribe, and their whānau, their family. Person-centred rehab, then, is not about individualised care, but rather about what is right for whānau. Recently, a Māori colleague tried to explain how he draws on his culture and his language, and how he relates to people. He talked about mokopuna. The literal, literal translation of mokopuna is grandchild. However, moko is a tattoo, and puna is short for tipuna, or ancestors. So a more nuanced translation of mokopuna is wearing the marks of your ancestors. Drawing from this, whenever my colleague interacts with others, he says he tries to treat them as if they are an ancestor in the waiting. Being mindful that how he treats others now may be formative to the next generation of mokopuna, or grandchildren. I think these ideas could hugely challenge how we think about person-centred rehab. These are just some examples of how engaging with Indigenous and non-Western perspectives can help us unpack and challenge some of our most taken-for-granted assumptions about topics like person-centred practice. So I've given some ideas and thinking around the concept and practice of person-centred rehab and so I'm going to finish by focusing on the system and organisational culture of person-centred rehab. So where have we come from? It's been argued that our systems are inherently unsupportive of person-centred rehab. Indeed, whenever we talk to professionals about this topic in New Zealand, their response is, yes, well, that would be nice, but we don't have time or we don't have resources, or our key performance indicators require us to focus our energy elsewhere. Let's take for argument's sake someone who's admitted to hospital following stroke. I don't know what the average length of stay is for that in the States, but in New Zealand, notwithstanding some of the early supported discharge programs we have, average length of stay in hospital following stroke is around three weeks. The key performance indicator that drives where we invest our time during that inpatient period is length of stay, with increasing pressure to reduce length of stay. I'm sure this is sounding familiar to you. Given this, the primary focus and where we invest our energy is getting people well enough and safe to discharge. This then determines the activities we prioritise during an inpatient stay. I ran a workshop recently with rehab professionals and experimented with using some creative activities to help them think differently about person-centred rehab. And I asked them to map out what activities they prioritise in this current context. You might not be able to see this image too clearly, but essentially the key activities they noted included things like assessment, treatment, education, and discharge planning. This quote here, however, from a person with stroke we interviewed about their experiences of rehab, I think really highlights how jarring this can be for patients who have experienced a significant event like stroke. I remember the first time the therapist at the hospital talked about setting goals. I said something about tramping again, perhaps swimming, perhaps even playing golf again. She said, what about getting up in the morning and getting dressed? And I thought, how's teeth? We're on a different page here. And my heart sank a bit. So I think this is, you know, a really good example of what we see happen in practice all the time. So despite best intentions, the biomedical model remains the dominant model driving care practices and rehabilitation. Care is often episodic with transitions across care environments or between hospital and home being inherently problematic. Despite a lot of work and movement towards interdisciplinary rehabilitation, care is often still very discipline specific and siloed, with each discipline still setting their own goals. And care is inherently service-centered, 
with organisational and system KPIs having a powerful influence on what is made to matter in practice at the coalface. This results in what I refer to as conditional person-centred rehab. So, I am person-centred, but sometimes people are just not good patients. Well, generally if they refuse therapy, like I say, put them on my timetable twice a week for three weeks and they refuse, you know, 80% of the sessions, or someone brings them down for two sessions, but then they don't come for me for the rest of the time or something like that, then I'll take them off because I'm really, really busy and I can't waste an hour trying to get someone out of bed each time. So I am person-centred, but I have a job to do. Some of the questions are very sensitive, so at times you're like, oh, I don't know if this is actually the right time for me to ask this, but that's, you know, how we do our first visit. I am person-centred, but it's important people are realistic. She did have a lot of goals around her mobility, which were really difficult though for the physio to manage because there wasn't realistic things that she wanted to be doing. So these are all quotes from health professionals we have spoken to in our research over the years, all highlighting this tension and pull between organisational system and professional factors and attending to and addressing the unique and specific needs and preferences of persons. There is, however, growing acknowledgement on the role of organisational systems and cultures in helping or hindering person-centred practice. For example, this definition in here from Brenda McCormick and colleagues based in Scotland finishes by saying, it is enabled by cultures of empowerment that foster continuous approaches to practice development, highlighting the context in which person-centred rehab is being implemented matters to sustain it. There are also some really great examples of frameworks that move beyond the dietic encounter. So this census framework here, developed by a team in Sheffield in the UK, is one I particularly like. They identify six senses that people need to experience. Security, continuity, belonging, purpose, achievement, and significance. However, instead of only focusing on optimising these things for patients, they argue that good care then can only be delivered when these things are experienced by all. So on the slide here is an example of how security might be experienced by not only older people, but staff and family members as well in the context of dementia care. So for older people, security um, might be experienced when attention is given to essential physiological needs for people to feel safe and free from threat to harm, pain, discomfort, where they receive competent and sensitive care. Security for staff may come when staff feel free from physical threat, rebuke or censure. They have secure conditions of employment. They have their emotional demands of their work recognised and they work within a supportive but challenging culture. And for family members to experience security, they need to feel confident in the knowledge and ability they have to provide good care without detriment to their own personal well-being. They have adequate support networks and timely help when required. I think there is much we can learn from frameworks like this that really help us to understand what a person-centred culture of care might look like. So, while there is general consensus on the importance of person-centred rehab, it's been argued that our systems and organisational cultures are inherently unsupportive. This has the potential to lead to more of what I call conditional person-centred rehab. There is, however, increasing recognition on the role that organisational cultures play in creating the context for person-centred rehab to occur, just like in the examples that I've just shared with you. So where do we go next with the system and organisational culture of person-centred rehab? First, 
we need to develop systems which make person-centred rehab possible. Earlier I gave an example where we focus our energy in a three-week inpatient stay following stroke to demonstrate how organisational KPIs drive where we invest our time. Imagine if we moved beyond that one episode of care and looked at that in the context of a person's life, in the context of stroke, where that inpatient stay is just one part of their journey. Imagine for a moment if the only KPI was the person was struck living the life they want to live and the key outcome of interest was their long-term health and well-being. When I asked my workshop participants how that might change how they spend their time within that three-week episode of care, they talked about things like getting to know the patient, building therapeutic relationship, building confidence, addressing emotional needs, not assessment, education and discharge planning. It's not to say that these things are not important, but shifting our focus to a different KPI helps us to think about how it could be different. Finally, we need to build person-centred cultures of care, which create the context for person-centred rehabilitation to occur. The things we've noted here are just some of the characteristics that may be important within a person-centred culture of care. Recognition of all persons in the process, not just patients and families, but also health providers. A system-wide commitment to person-centred rehabilitation so that the structures and processes that drive how we work make person-centred rehab possible rather than person-centred rehab happening in spite of the system. Working with families, patients, professionals to co-design and co-produce rehab services. Dynamic measurement. The more nuanced approach to person-centred rehab we have talked about in this presentation makes it more challenging to measure the extent to which person-centred rehab is embedded into practice. So we need to develop more dynamic assessments to measure this complex phenomenon. These measurements may not be about did person-centred rehab happen or not, but they may tap into how it happens, what allows it to happen, what skills are needed, and so on. Communities of practice to support ongoing practice development and finally, structural supports which enable rehab professionals to manage the inevitable tensions and uncertainties that arise. These are just some examples of what a person-centred culture of care might look like. So, we've talked about where we've come from with person-centred rehab by focusing on the rhetoric and brand, the concept and practice, in the system and organisational culture of person-centred rehab. In, in drawing on where we've come from, we've proposed some possibilities for where we need to go next. So these six um, possibilities are listed on the board here. And I invite you to join us in developing a plan for how we can collectively work towards these things. How can we collectively build on multidimensional and principles-based approaches to person-centred rehab, move towards a continuum of person-centred rehab, legitimise value and build capability for person-centred rehab, move beyond Western-centric understandings of person-centred rehab, develop systems which make person-centred rehab possible, and lastly, build person-centred cultures of care. So I'm going to come back to that last slide in a moment so that we can leave that with you. In the meantime, I just wanted to thank Christina for working with me in developing this presentation. And I also want to acknowledge all my colleagues at the Centre for Person-Centred Research and our collaborators whose collective work has been formative to my thinking on this topic and who continue to challenge me. And thank you to all of you for listening to this presentation. Nā mihi noi ki a koutou. A big thank you to you all. Um, so here's a list of references if you want to follow up any of the references that I've referred to throughout the presentation. 
and um, here's some advice from the ACRM about how you can obtain CME or CE credits um, through this session. But I'm going to finish um, by leaving you um, with these um, six possibilities for where we go next with person-centred rehabilitation. Thank you.